Hello friends, I'm Lucy and welcome to Reality Check. You might remember that before the days of the base building, super mutant shooting, time sink that is Fallout 4, I made an episode of this very show all about what would actually happen to the ecosystem of the world if nuclear bombs were to fall. If you haven't seen it, I'll pop a link at the end of the episode so you can take a look-see. I thought it'd be interesting to do a couple of follow-up episodes all around nuclear war, wasteland life and other really cheery scenarios. This week though, let's tackle how we would survive a nuclear blast. In the 1950s and 60s, the threat of a nuclear war was so ingrained in the public consciousness that nuclear safety drills were taught in schools and educational segments were even broadcasted on radio set to popular show tunes. So basically just one step away from having cheery vault tech employees selling us promises of safety door to door. But in the boring old real world where access to life preserving yet ethically dubious vaults isn't really possible, what would us average Joes do? Well luckily for us we have two good sources to draw on to see how we'd fare. The first from atmospheric scientist Michael Dillon, who has spent years figuring out survival methods for just such an occasion. We can also anticipate what to expect from the planning guidance for response to a nuclear detonation from the and brace yourself, National Security Staff Interagency Policy Coordination Subcommittee for Preparedness and Response to Radiological and Nuclear Threats, and good grief, that's a long title for a committee. It's worth bearing in mind that Dylan's stuff is purely theoretical and based on nukes with yields between 0.1 to 10 kilotons. So for comparison's sake, the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II had yields of between 15 and 21 kilotons, and the yields of the bombs in Fallout's Great War are between 200 and 750 kilotons. For the purposes of this video, we will be going with Dylan's calculations, even if they're smaller range nukes, but it's worth bearing in mind that some of these techniques have been used when there's been more powerful detonations. So the alarms blare, the nukes are falling. What's actually happening? Well, first up, there'll be the blast, a rapidly expanding fireball which generates a pressure wave that moves away from the point of detonation. Now, the blast wave moves relatively slowly. Once it gets about a mile away from ground zero, it'll take roughly five seconds to cover each mile. But on top of this, the blast wave also generates high winds, reaching up to 160 miles an hour with a 10 kiloton explosion. Add this all together, and in the immediate blast zone, you're looking at massive damage to buildings, fires, and a 90% plus likelihood of instant and death. For a 10 kiloton nuke, you'll be in immediate radiation danger if you're less than a kilometer away from ground zero, and at risk from fallout contamination from 10 to 20 miles away. But let's say you're over a mile out. You see the flash, hear the bang, what do you do? Well, in the 1950s, at the height of the atomic age at least, you'd get under the table. This traces back to World War I, where countries like the US, the USSR, Germany, and the UK came up with basic civil defense practices to teach civilians how to protect themselves in the likelihood of a military attack. The phrase duck and cover was everything, and it was famously made into a cartoon where careful Bert the Turtle taught some rather nonplussed children about how to survive in the event of atomic annihilation. They were told, get indoors, do not look at the flash, get away from windows, cower under sturdy door frames or tables, and to cover their skin. It sounds like common sense, and it is, but you can't deny its effectiveness. Unless you're right next to Ground Zero, but you know, we already covered that. People as close as 170 meters to Ground Zero at Hiroshima and Nagasaki managed to survive the blast purely because they were inside reinforced concrete buildings. Survivor Miyoko Matsubara immediately dropped to the floor when she saw the blast and said that she saw those who were still standing simply get blown away. In Russia, school teacher Yulia Karbasheva saw the flash in what was ultimately called the Chelyabinsk meteor explosion. She ordered all of her students to duck and cover. Not a single one of those children got injured, whereas Yulia got cut up quite badly by the imploding glass because she was near a window and she didn't get down in time. It's natural human instinct to want to see what causes big loud bangs or find the source of a flash, but the truth is nuclear explosions are such an intense source of light that looking directly at the thermal flash even from 15 miles away can cause temporary or even permanent blindness, so try and fight the urge to look. Another thing to take into account is your clothing. By using it to cover as much of your skin as possible, you're less susceptible to flash burns from the blast. With a 10 kiloton explosion, you can still get burned up to 2 miles away from the blast zone, so cover up. But after things have died down, remember that your clothing is likely to be coated in radioactive contamination, especially if you are outside during the blast. Take it off and shower with soap if you can. 
So you've taken shelter, how long do you stay there for? Referring back to Dylan's hypothetical scenario, if a bomb of around 10 kilotons were to be dropped and you're over half a mile away from the blast radius, he reckons you need to wait about 30 minutes for the initial radiation to dispel before searching for adequate and preferably thick concrete walled shelter. From there, wait for between 12 to 24 hours because the blast isn't the last of it. Angry, dangerous radioactive particles are gonna start raining down from the sky and this is what's known as fallout. So what's so bad about this early nuclear fallout compared to other regular fallout? Well, exposure to radiation can lead to cancer later in life, but this early fallout is the stuff that's really dangerous in the short term. These highly radioactive particles are gonna give you radiation sickness pretty much immediately, which can range anywhere from slight nausea to burning skin, dizziness, headaches, and with increased exposure comes a higher likelihood of death. Luckily, and if luckily is a word you can use in an atomic blast situation, the half-life of this early fallout is relatively short and it decays quite quickly, which is why it may be possible to go outside within a day or so. But Dylan and other experts do say that it's best to wait from the okay from the authorities before venturing out from safety. And then rebuild, which is what we'll be covering on the next episode. Food supply, water, and maybe even some basic survival techniques. Basically, it's way more difficult than Fallout makes it look. If you missed the last radioactive episode, then check the link on your screen now to give it a look. That's all for this week. Reality Check will return in two weeks' time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, I'm on Twitter at LucyJamesGames, and I'll see you next time.